These chapters continue the narration of the struggle between Saul and David over who is ultimately going to be king over Israel. Now, it's not a matter of rebellion or a coup d'etat or anything like that. But God anointed Saul as king. Saul lost that privilege when he rejected the Lord and began to do things his way. And God then anointed David to be the king someday. And this has led to a rift between Saul and David. And the last thing we saw was David run away from the court of the king. And even though Saul is the king and is the Lord's anointed, and David is going to make it very clear, I will not attack or harm or kill the Lord's anointed, you can see the the people of Israel are slowly shifting their loyalty over to David. And it's driving Saul crazy. David married Saul's daughter. He's best friends with Saul's son. David was the commander of the captain of the guard. David was was a military leader. They were writing songs about him. And we're going to see in this chapter the pursuit of David really begins in earnest, which we all know those stories, how Saul is going to chase David. He's going to hunt him down. And in this passage particularly, there are lessons for us to be learned in leadership. That's pretty much what we're going to be talking about today is leadership. Now, you may not be king. In fact, I'm willing to bet most of you are not king of something. But if you are a servant somewhere in the church, or if you are a parent, or if you have a job, then there are going to be opportunities where you need to take a point of leadership. Whether that is formally where you are the one in charge, you're the boss, or if you need to step up in order to lead other people towards what God is calling you to do. There are going to be times when you've got to take charge in your life. And I am one who loves a good leadership book. You go to my office, I've got a few of those. I've got more than a few of those, actually. And I, (laughs) it's kind of like, they're like my children. I love them all. They're all got something good to learn. I love studying and figuring out how to do things, and I don't love them all. There are a few that these people have no clue what they're doing. But, but really, when it comes to leadership in God's kingdom, while skills are important, read Proverbs, it is more about being the kind of man that other people will follow. That is more important. If you read the book of Timothy and Titus, it talks about being apt to teach and so forth. But more than anything else, it emphasizes being blameless. It emphasizes being the character that people will follow and that God can use. And that's what we're going to look at today is what does it take to be a man worth following like David? You're going to watch as the the people are going to start to depart from Saul and go towards David. And what is it about him that makes him worth following? And what is it about Saul that caused the people to abandon him? So two chapters today. We're going to start reading verses 1 through 9 of chapter 21. Then David came to... Nov, that would be pronounced. Nob is how it reads in English, but to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David trembling and said to him, Why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence the show bread, it is sometimes called, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. Yeah, because the king was chasing him. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. Okay, so last thing we saw, David fled from Saul. He and Jonathan worked out a plan to determine if Saul really did want to kill David. Jonathan wasn't convinced until his dad threw a spear at him. He's like, okay, yeah, dad is not kidding around here. So David departed and he's fled to this place called Nov. 
Now, this is a, a shrine of some kind because the priests are here. It is not certain whether or not the tabernacle is here. This could be another group of priests that would serve in the rotation that the Bible talks about. Uh, they do have the, the bread of the presence here, but the bread of the presence would be taken from the tabernacle, the holy place, and distributed to the priests. So it could be that the tabernacle is here. It could not be. And when Ahimelech asks him what he's doing there, David dissembles a little bit. He says, the king has sent me on a mission, which is kind of, sort of true. <laughs> it's like, if I don't go from the king, then the king is going to kill me. It could be that David is obliquely referring to the Lord here, or the fact that David himself is the true king of Israel. Um, or it could be that he's, he's being deceptive, and this is one of those things that needed to be done, being shrewd as a serpent, the Bible says. But he says, I'm on official business, and I need food. So what do you have for me? What do you have food for the journey? Well, the only bread available was what I grew up calling the show bread, but the bread of the presence. This would be loaves of unleavened bread. They were large. It would have been big like this. So when he says five loaves, don't think like a thing of wonder bread here. Like this is, this is a lot of food. They would make 12 of these, put them in stacks of six in the holy place on the golden table. They would put frankincense on top of it, which would keep it fresh and keep it smelling well. And they would keep it there for a week. After a week, new loaves would replace them and the old ones would be taken out, at which time it would be given to the priest because the priest did not do any kind of ordinary labor. So they were fed through the work of the tabernacle and through later on the temple, the sacrifices and so on. You can read about this in Leviticus chapter four, if you like, or no, Leviticus chapter 24, verses five through nine. So David is not a priest. And he's not supposed to eat this bread. It was only supposed to be eaten by the priesthood or their families in a holy state, in a consecrated state. And Ahimelech makes an exception for David. As long as he confirms that the men that he's going to are consecrated, as long as they are in a state of cleanness, they would be allowed to, to eat these things. And David says, we always do that. When we go out to battle, we discipline our bodies. We discipline ourselves sexually uh, until the battle is over. And this actually, believe it or not, was a very common thing that would happen in the ancient world, but it's especially important for the, the children of Israel. Now, while this is happening, and as he's going to get the sword of Goliath, which I don't know how big it was, but I always think of like Final Fantasy, man, the giant sword over the back of his head. And uh, some of you are my people in here. And, uh, and he's going to carry this thing into battle. So David's not the little boy anymore who's unable to do that and throwing a sling. He knows how to use a sword. He knows how to use armor. And... We have this ominous note about this man, Doeg, who was an Edomite, which means he was a descendant of Esau, right? Esau's nickname was Edom, which meant red. Esau meant hairy. He had those, those very descriptive names, didn't he? And he saw this happen. It said that he had been detained by the priests. So we don't know what this guy had done, but he was under arrest and was probably going to be standing trial before these priests. He was the one in charge of all of Saul's herds. And he sees this happen, and he's going to see here an opportunity to get in good with the king again, and it's going to end very tragically. Well, we're going to look at three qualities as we look at David here that make a man worthy to be followed. And then as we look at Saul, we're going to see the opposite of those three things that make a man unworthy to be followed. And the first thing that we see, the first quality that people will follow is faith. Quite simply, faith. When David is in trouble, where does he go? Last time, went to Samuel, went to Ramah with Samuel so that he could be with the prophets. This time he runs, he goes, where do I go? First thing, I got to go to the priest and I got to find out what God has to say about what's going to happen. If I need help, I go to the Lord. We're going to see later on that when David can't go anywhere else, it will say he strengthens himself in the Lord. He had that ability to seek the Lord even when things were, were bad. He had faith that God would act for him. This is a key characteristic of the kind of people who should be in charge are the people who love the Lord, know the Lord, and believe that God will act when we step out. We, do, we don't want to follow, certainly not in the church, but even in life, these deistic leaders who believe God's out there, but he ain't going to do nothing. It's like, that's not the God that I serve. I believe that God will act when we step out. The Bible tells us over and over again, Isaiah 64, it says, where is there a God like you who acts for those who wait for him? Psalm 37, David himself would write, trust in the Lord and he will act for you. The Lord acts for his people. So if you're going to be in charge, you need to believe that. You need to believe that. 
This is how they chose leaders in the New Testament. You had the 11 apostles, and then it became 12 again when they added Matthias to the roster. But then in Acts chapter 6, when things began to get a little busy, and they had a lot of other ministry going on, they chose these seven men who became known as the first deacons. And listen to how it describes them here in Acts chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. When Peter says, go pick seven men yourselves, it pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen. How do we describe Stephen? A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Man, if that could be a description of me someday. Full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles and they prayed and laid their hands on them. When we're looking for men to lead in the church, they said, look for guys that are filled with faith. And by the way, you're not going to be called full of the Holy Spirit if you don't have faith. Because that's where our power comes from as Christians, isn't it? David had this quality. David's the one that saw Goliath and said, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that defies the armies of the living God? When everybody else was, was afraid, David says, I'll take him. I'll go swing my slingshot. Remember he went to Saul and said, Let not the king's heart fail him. I got this one. Little Davy's got this one. So did Jonathan, remember? Let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing prevents the Lord from saving by many or by few. Let's go see if we can win the battle by ourselves. What do you say? Seems kind of rash, Jonathan. Yeah, but God could though, right? He could do that. And so he said, all right, let's give it a try. And God gave them an amazing victory. Elijah had this kind of faith, did he not? Elijah called down fire from heaven a couple times. (laughs) That's pretty cool. Where they come to arrest Elijah. You're under arrest, Elijah. We've come to arrest the man of God. He goes, oh, I'm a man of God. Lord, if I'm a man of God, then may fire come down from heaven. Vroom! Consumed him. So what did Ahab do? He sent another one. Well, he won't be able to do that trick twice. Well, he did. Three times. Until the last guy showed up waving a white flag, says, please don't kill me. Please don't do this. And then he went. Elisha had faith in the Lord. Elisha had faith for resurrection from the dead. When the widow's son was, was dead, he gave his servant his staff, his go run, run home, touch his face with the stick, and he'll come back to life. And that didn't work. So what does he do? Well, let's go. He didn't say, I guess the Lord doesn't want to heal your son, ma'am. I'm very sorry, but you know what? Heaven is waiting for us. No, he said, oh, well, let's go, and I'll pray for him. And he prays for him and stretches out over him and prays again and again until the Lord finally gave him the answer. Ezra, Nehemiah had faith. We're going to go back. We're going to rebuild that temple. We're going to build that wall. And the Lord is going to restore us. The apostles, you've got to be able to lead others to God first before you go anywhere else. Before you take anybody anywhere else, you've got to take them to the Lord. You can't just lead based on the plans that you've made, although you should make plans. You should not lead people just based on the circumstances around you, although those will affect the decisions you make. Ultimately, it is we are going to go this way as if the Lord is going to act for us. And if you believe that God will act for you, that will affect the decisions that you make, won't it? We walk by faith and not by sight. It's very difficult to live as if God was real all the time. But that's what our leaders need to be able to do. A leader has to have faith when no one else does. At the first sign of trouble, he runs to Jesus. A leader needs to be able to stand like Moses when all the people are ready to chop your head off and take it to Pharaoh and say, will you please forgive us now? And say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And you cultivate that in the secret place like David had done. Faith is the first thing that makes a man worth following. The second one that we see also in this section is Liberty, spiritual liberty and freedom. What am I talking about? David ate the holy bread that he was not supposed to eat. Now, if you want to be technical about it, this was a violation of the law of Moses. This could be categorized, if you read it uh, rigidly, as a sin. But the priest gave it to David, and also David did not spurn to take it and then to eat it. Because Ahimelech recognized the need of David and how this was important that this man, who is the Lord's anointed and is sent out to do the king's work, needs this. Jesus himself specifically addressed this issue. We talked about it not long in Mark chapter 2 on Wednesday night when they were criticizing Jesus because on the Sabbath day they're walking through the field and they're pulling the heads of grain and they would crack the shell and throw the the chaff up in the air and, and eat it like a snack which they were allowed to do according to the law, but they said, you can't harvest on the Sabbath day. 
Jesus is like, who's harvesting? They're, they're plucking heads of grain. Remember when you were a kid, you'd pick, take honeysuckle out? Anybody else do that when you were a kid? Yeah. What's the big deal? That's not harvesting. It's not work. And this is what he says. Have you never read what David did when he was in need and he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest. We'll meet him in a second. And ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. He says, you're worried about these guys eating grain on the Sabbath day. David ate the showbread. <laughs> the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is saying, look, yes, the Lord has given his laws out, but there are times when human need is more important than following the rigid letter of the ceremony here. Not talking about sin now, talking about the, these, these commandments of the law that God had laid down. It's like, look, there's going to be times where people are hungry, and if all you got is a showbread, you're going to let them starve? And he says, and the Sabbath, by the way, was supposed to be a day off for my people. And now you've got them so scared they don't want to leave the house because they might accidentally break the Sabbath. And then you'll be jumping all over them. David understood what we call the spirit of the law. You know, we use that as a legal term. We get it from Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians. He contrasts the law and the letter with the spirit of the law. And David had such a love for God. He was able to recognize, as Ahimelech did, that us eating this bread is, is not a great violation here because of our circumstances. I wonder, it doesn't say anything, but I wonder if this bread was ever given to those that were beggars or those that were hurt or those that came to, came to stay. Now, I would, I would think this would be an exception, but the Lord gave David liberty in regards to the law, which is exactly what God has done for us in the New Testament because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That we are set free from these things. Galatians says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Why did God set you free? So you could be free. So don't, he says, submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't spend all your time coming up with extra rules to weigh people down again. This is the kind of person you must follow. Somebody who knows God so deeply and understands the commandments and the gospel so well that he walks in liberty and freedom as regards salvation, not not burdens, not leading other people to these, these difficult things that they can't bear and that they can't handle, not obsessed with rules and legalism. He's obsessed with grace and the gospel and with liberty. You know, it's very, it can be very compelling to follow people that seem like they're taking a strong stand for what's right and wrong, when in reality, they're just taking a strong stand for their hobby horses or their cultural matters that have nothing to do with what God actually said. We need to follow leaders that are going to keep us from unnecessary burdens. And you also, as a leader, this is just a, a rule that I had as a youth pastor, and I've tried to maintain it here too. Try to make as few rules as you possibly can. Because once you make the rule, you've got to enforce the rule. And you know what else you do? Now you've drawn a very firm line about what is and is not appropriate, and clever bad people will find a way to dance around that line and say, well, I didn't violate the law. I found it much more useful just to say, this is what we're trying to do here. You know, I, I always use the example of bathing suits with our, our youth group. I didn't go out and give the proper dimensions of a swimsuit. I just said, everybody, please dress modestly. And I never had a problem. Because if you, if you much easier to say, well, this matches the, the rigid system he gave us, as opposed to saying, can I honestly say before Jesus that this is modest? Do you know what I'm saying? We want to follow leaders that have liberty as concerns the Lord. They're focused on the heart of God more than the, the, the secondary matters that are less important. David seems like the kind of person that is passionate about the Lord and is going to insist on what is right and wrong. But when it concerns human need, when it concerns matters that are secondary, he knew how to keep those things in proportion and focus on the relationship with God first. Well, we're going to hear our next one in, in verse 10. And this is kind of a weird set of verses that maybe you're not used to, but let's read this. David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to, want to say it with me? Achish. Say Achish. Good job. We'll just call it Achish. Uh, <laughs> went to Achish, the king of Gath. <laughs> and the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? So you see how the Philistines were already kind of understanding David to be the true king of Israel. Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart, was very much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. 
So what do you do when the king realizes that you're a war hero for the other team? How do you get out of that? Well, here's what David did. He changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Isn't that strange? Maybe this was a split-second decision, like a last-ditch thing. It's like, oh, we've got you now, David. You're going before the king. And David, what's wrong with you? And he's drooling, and he starts, like, writing crazy things on the wall. Like, the end is coming. And, you know, he's, and he brings him in. And we've, we've captured the, the, the warlord of Israel, David. And he's over there, just, you know, just acting crazy and, like, spitting and drooling. And the guy goes, I've got enough crazy people in my town. Why are you bringing this guy in here? Get him out of here. <laughs> it's pretty strange, isn't it? Apparently, he was quite convincing because it worked. What did this lead to? It led to David being completely disregarded by the king of Gath. And it allowed him to hide. Now, it doesn't say how long he was there. Uh, there's two ways of looking at this. Number one is David thought he would be safe in Gath, wasn't, and this is how he got away. Or number two, David stayed there for a time, and anytime anybody saw him, he had to put on the whole crazy guy act again. Doesn't say how long. But what can we learn from this? Maybe not the lesson you think. Uh, <laughs> the third quality of a man that people will follow is humility. And I'm going to define humility this morning. Lack of concern with one's own reputation. Consider, <laughs> consider how embarrassing this would have been. Of hiding. First of all, you're hiding from your king. Then you're being shamed in front of the Philistines. You're the guy that killed Goliath. And you've got his sword. Like you, you are the ultimate Philistine beater. You killed 200 of them and cut off their foreskins as a bride price for your wife. Now you're in their city. And you've got to act like a crazy man. And they're all going to be mocking you and laughing at you. Being shamed there. Psalm 34. We actually sing the song. Psalm 34 sometimes. Magnify the Lord with me, right? I sought the Lord and he answered me. David wrote that psalm during this period of his life, it tells us. I'll read verses 17 through 19 here. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. That tells you how David felt about himself at this point. I feel crushed right now. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Humility. David was a warrior. He was going to be king. He was the man after God's own heart. He was a hero. He could have strolled in to Gath and said, you're either going to hide me here or I'm going to burn your city to the ground. Instead, he acts like a madman. He lets his reputation take a major hit for the rest of his life. And he didn't mind. Because it was either that or go back and start a war against his, his father-in-law, the king Saul. Humility, it's so important was called the meekest man on earth. In fact, the first time Moses tried to deliver the children of Israel, he thought he was going to be Spartacus and start a slave rebellion. He says, Moses went to the people, assuming that they knew that he was their deliverer. And so when he sees one Egyptian beating a Hebrew, he kills the Egyptian. And he comes back the next day and he's like, they're probably already talking about me. Already right, talking about the mighty Moses is going to come and get us out of here. So he sees the guys fighting each other, two Hebrews fighting each other the next day. He goes, hey, brothers, brothers, what are we fighting each other for? we got to be fighting the dead. And they go, get out of here. You're going to kill me too like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And Moses realizes, this is not going to go the way I thought it would. So what did God do? He sent him away to the desert for 40 years tending sheep, which it says in the Bible that sheep are an abomination to the Egyptians. They thought it was gross to tend sheep. So he had to spend an equal amount of time doing an abominable job in the backside of the desert as he did being raised in Pharaoh's court before he was ready. So that the next time the Lord came to him, rather than saying, well, it's about time you showed up, burning bush, he says, who am I to go and tell Pharaoh anything? He was usable now. You need that humility. Ezra, when Ezra found out that the people were committing the same kind of sins that had caused them to be exiled in the first place, he went to the temple and openly wept. And you know something? It led to a mighty revival. 
He's there in the temple weeping over his people. And that level of brokenness over his own people that he was in charge of as, as their teacher, as their scribe, caused them all to come and repent. Paul never asserted himself. Paul was, I'm the least of the apostles. When they were fighting in Corinth over, do I, you follow Paul or Apollos or Peter or Jesus? He said, look, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? They're vessels. I don't care who gets the credit. As long as God is glorified, I don't really mind. In Philippians, he'd say, there are some people out there preaching the gospel because I'm in prison because they think they're going to take away some of my disciples, but I don't care because they're baptizing people and they're getting saved. Hallelujah, Jesus. That's leadership. There is an amazing power that you possess when you do not care who gets the credit. When you don't care who the people's favorite is, when you don't care if you get recognized or if you get a prize, when you don't care, all you care is about getting things done, it liberates you to be used by God. It liberates you to deal with people in a way that's apart from your own ego. That when someone comes in and they've got a problem and you give them advice and they throw it in your face, you're not going to take it personally because who are you? If I've got to act like a madman, everybody think I'm crazy for a while, then so be it. David will tell Michael, his wife, later on, when she didn't like how wildly he was dancing as the king of Israel when the ark was being brought in, she said, oh, how the king of Israel has dignified himself before the people today. And David goes, you ain't seen nothing yet, Michael. I'll become even more undignified than this if it's before the Lord. I don't, I don't hold anything back when it comes to me and our Father in heaven. And as Jesus said, that's what it means to be great in his kingdom, to be a servant of all. You've got to embrace the humiliation of your life because then you will be usable. God will see that and the vindication will come later. So these are these three qualities that we see about David. He had faith, he had liberty in his spirituality, and he was humble. And so we get to chapter 22. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became commander over them, and there were with him about 400 men. David's mighty men. And David went from there to Mitzpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, I want to circle that name, we will see him again. Do not remain in the stronghold, depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. So he escapes to this cave, and his family joins him there. I mentioned last time that because David's brother had called him to Bethlehem, it could indicate that his father had passed away. I was mistaken about that because we see his father right here. So uh, you keep reading and that's, that's how you know if you're right about things in the Bible. He ends up sending his family to Moab. Apparently he had a relationship with the king there and, and they were protected. But it was at Adullam that David's band of mighty men began to gather to him. Kind of like Robin Hood and his merry men, except David had mighty men. They weren't merry. He says, those who are in distress. So those people that were facing all kinds of trouble, they found David and say, I'm going to go to David. I'm going to fight with him. Those who had debts. That's an interesting crowd. Those that were about to get sold into debt slavery is probably what that means. And those who were bitter. What a crew to be gathered around you. Like, who do you have following you? Well, I've got a bunch of really bitter people. I got some folks that are, are so broke that they're about to get enslaved, so they've kind of got nothing left to lose. And then I've got a bunch of people that are dealing with all sorts of bad problems, and they said, hey, we'll come and fight for you in the wilderness. But they followed David. What kind of leader did he have to be to keep this kind of man in line for the rest of his life? When David flees from Absalom, it's going to say the 400 men who had been with him since the wilderness went with him. That's these guys right here. People followed David. They followed him to Adullam. They followed him to Mizpah. Gad, the prophet, sent him into the forest of Hereth. They followed him. That's what happens when you live your life this way, guys. People notice. When you have a mighty faith in the Lord, when you have liberty in the matters of his law and a humility concerning yourself, God will see to it that men will follow you. And also, those are the kinds of people we ought to be looking for. We don't always have the best choice if we even have a choice of who's going to be in charge and who's going to lead us. But these are the kind of things that we ought to be looking for and to be cultivating in ourselves. Well, that's David. Let's move on to King Saul. And as I've said before, if, if you like 
medieval stuff, if you like books or, or movies where it's the king and his court and there's intrigue and betrayal, this is the book for you. Get this picture in your mind, verse 6. Now Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand. Now, we've seen Saul hurl that spear a couple times recently. And all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin. Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me? No one discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me. Or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as it is this day? Then answered Doeg the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul. I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nov, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahituv. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. What a picture! What an ominous picture of Saul. He's holding court, sitting under a tree with a spear in his hand. You you don't want to walk into the room with the president and he's got a loaded gun in his hands. That meeting's not going to go well. You walk in and your boss is sitting there putting bullets into a revolver. You might start to get a little concerned. He's like, I looked at your uh, quarterly reports from this last. (laughs) Would you care to explain yourself? Could we do it later maybe? He's standing there with a spear, and he's he's ranting and raving. Like, all of you are conspiring against me. Nobody tells me anything. Nobody feels sorry for me. And, of course, nobody wants to say anything, because if they do, they're going to get skewered by the king of Israel. He accuses them all of being disloyal until Doeg, that Edomite, informs on David. He says, well, I've seen David. I saw David at at the holy place. And the, the high priest gave him the sword and inquired of the Lord for him. And I'll bet you these men that knew about David were heartbroken when they heard that. They didn't want David dead. David had been their commander before this, their captain. And, and here you see the great contrast between David and Saul. David, who is on his way to gaining the kingdom, and Saul, who is well on his way to losing the very kingdom. That the characteristics we see of Saul in this passage are the direct inverse of the ones we see about David in the previous one. Rather than faith, Saul was characterized by fear. He's paranoid. We saw in the previous chapter, he always sat with his back to the wall. Anybody coming up behind me. He was paranoid. He was afraid. He's jumping at shadows. He's chasing his most loyal servant down because he's afraid he might take his, his place. And he had let his fears drive him away from the Lord into madness and into murder. David is feigning madness, but Saul's out of his mind. And this is not a characteristic you want in leaders. I mean, obviously, right? Isaiah chapter 8, speaking to the king, he says, Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. There's a good line to type up and put on your computer screen or your phone. Don't call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And don't fear what they fear. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. (laughs) Aren't you afraid what's going to happen politically? I'm more afraid of what will happen if we don't honor the Lord this time around. Leaders are full of fear. Now, it's one thing to be afraid and then be courageous. It's another thing to give in to your fear. Adam was afraid to lose Eve. That's why he ate the fruit. Eve was deceived, but the Bible tells us Adam was not. Adam knew exactly what he was doing, but he was afraid to lose her. Oh, how romantic. No, it doomed the entire human race. Peter was afraid and denied Jesus. Aren't you one of his disciples? Nope, never heard of him. Never seen him in my entire life. That story just kills me because Peter and John were both there that night, and that was enough witnesses legally to get Jesus off the hook. And they said nothing. They were afraid. Hezekiah, one of Israel's great kings, had an amazing revival, tore down the high places. When Assyria invaded his country, rather than say, we're going to go to battle and trust the Lord like Jehoshaphat had done, instead he goes into the temple, takes all the treasure out, strips all the gold off of everything, and tries to bribe the king of Assyria to leave. And guess what? He didn't. 
He took the treasure and attacked the city anyway. Not his finest hour. When you are afraid, you become panicked. And maybe you become indecisive. It's one of those two things. You're either going to be hurtling towards the wrong decision, or you're not going to be able to do anything. You're just going to stand there until things start to happen to you. Or you become harsh and cruel because you're afraid. If you see anybody else express anything that resembles fear, you come down on them hard because you can't afford there to be any kind of indecision. But when you're afraid, you're never going to make a good decision, certainly not a godly one. And so for those of you that are in leadership, dad, mother, those of you that are in ministry, those of you that serve at work, you can't make decisions from a place of fear. You won't make good ones. You have to get alone with the Lord and let him take that fear from you and then make a wise decision. We might put it this way. A leader needs to be able to handle fear when it comes. We need brave leaders. Leaders don't have the luxury to be driven by fear. And when you are in leadership, friend, you don't have the same luxuries as everybody else. You know, dad, mom, maybe. We'll pick on dad for a little bit. You know, you might feel like, well, nobody really attends to my needs and nobody really cares about what I want and I'm upset too, but nobody comes to me. Lump it, buddy. You're the one in charge. They need you. Now, your wife will be there for you and your children will grow and they'll love on you and that's what the church is for. But they need you to step up and lead the way. And sometimes that means you've got to put the burden on your back and keep going. You've got to be able to strengthen yourself in the Lord and not become selfish. You teach this to your children, don't you? When they're little... They get what they want because they can't move and they cry. And if you, you know, if you don't give them what they want, then it's going to be really loud. <laughs> and, you know, they won't be able to eat and stuff like that, too. But, but as they get older, what do you teach them? It's like, hey, you can sleep through the night. Stop waking everybody up screaming real loud. Or you say, hey, you can do this yourself. You don't need to get your mother every time you want a snack out of the refrigerator. You're big enough to do that, right? Well, it keeps on going until you've, you become a man. And now you've got a wife to take care of. And now you've got a family. And then especially when there's multiple generations, you've got to be able to step up and say, all right, Lord, I don't know what to do, but you've got to help me. Maybe that's a word for somebody today. I don't know. You've got to be able to rise above your fear through faith in Christ. All right, verse 11. I think we got time. How about that? Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech's name means my brother, the king, or the king is my brother. Maybe it's a significant name. The son of... Ahituv, a high tub is how I grew up saying that. And all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Here now, son of a high tub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? You and the son of Jesse. Saul kind of goes out of his way not to say David's name, if you look at this carefully. And that you have given him bread and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait as it is this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law and captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I've inquired of God for him? No, let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of my father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David. And they knew that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doeg, You turn and strike the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned and struck down the priests. And he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. The ephod is the garment that the priests wore. And Nov, the city of the priests, he put to the sword. Both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey and sheep, he put to the sword. Saul summons Ahimelech and the priests, puts him on trial for apparently aiding David's conspiracy. And Ahimelech doesn't know what he's talking about. And you can admire the, the boldness of Ahimelech here. He says, David is your guy, Saul. He's the most faithful servant you have. He's the captain of your guard. Everybody loves him. Don't, you shouldn't say things like that about David. And even if there was something on, going on, I certainly didn't know about it. Yes, I inquired of the Lord for him. I did that for David all the time. He's a godly man. He admitted to helping David because he knew that David was loyal and godly. But Saul ordered the death of of the priests. What a mark 
on the house of Saul. Initially, though, his own bodyguard refused. I won't do it. I don't care if you're the king. I'm not striking down the priests. And then he turns to this Edomite, who not only killed the priest, but went back to Nob and laid waste to the city as well. Which is one reason why I don't know if I believe the tabernacle was there. Because that would have been a rather offensive event to happen in Israel. But maybe it was just that bad. Who knows? Saul had no relationship with God. And so as opposed to the liberty that David was able to exercise in the things of God, Saul was cruel when it came to the matters of the law. Cruelty rather than freedom. Saul probably felt pious right about now. Himself as the Lord's anointed. God anointed me and you're supposed to be the one who uh, defends the, the king and you're supposed to be the one that uh, attacks my enemies and you, you also violated the showbread. You're a sinner and you're going to die for it. And one of the reasons I believe that is because the language that is used to describe what uh, Doeg did to the city is the language that is used to describe the haram in the book of Joshua, which is the ban, the, the devotion to destruction. And Saul does this to the priests in his own, in his own country. So this seems to be as, as a sort of a mockery of holy war against the priests of the Lord. This is what leaders who do not know Jesus, but presume to have a word and opinion on the matters of God, will be like. Jesus said about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 4, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. He says, this is what bad spiritual leadership looks like. You tie up a giant spiritual religious burden, you put it on somebody's back, and yet you don't do a single thing to help them. That's Saul. The Pharisees, of course, were like that. They were constantly going through the law and adding new restrictions and more restrictions and more restrictions. The Judaizers of Paul's day, Paul goes and preaches the gospel of grace and liberty, and they would come behind him and say, yeah, but you've got to be circumcised, and you've also got to keep the law, and you've also got to do all these things. I think of Judah in the Old Testament when his daughter-in-law, Tamar, was found with child, and he's about to order her executed, when it was he himself who had been with her thinking she was a and, and had sired that child. It's like, you're going to be that hypocritical, that cruel in matters of spirituality when you yourself don't observe these rules at all? Even Saul himself had done this earlier. Remember the honey episode? When Jonathan ate the honey and Saul said, you will die because we swore that no one would eat today. It's like, your religion is cruel, Saul. You don't know God at all, do you? David knew God, and David's relationship with God allowed David even to technically violate some of these statutes because the relationship was more important. But because Saul had no relationship, all he had was the commandments. And because he didn't know God nor the commandments, he enforced them with a wicked cruelty on people. It's a temptation to bad leaders to use religion as a tool to oppress and dominate people. And it can be nationally, you know, my friends in Russia talk about how during the Soviet years, it was well known that all the confessors in the Orthodox Church were KJB agents. You tell them anything and they're going to be reporting it back to headquarters. There's that. But it also can just be in your own life. You can't just try to get your way. You've got to bring God into it. And you abuse people, but you use Jesus' name to do it. You have rules with no room for mercy no room for grace. You can stand up there and you can preach holiness and piety all day long, but you have nothing to say when it comes to matters of mercy and kindness and grace and liberty. That's why Jesus would tell the Pharisees, go and learn this. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I'm more concerned with love than I am with you getting all the rules right. And ultimately, it's a temptation of hypocrisy because I have found, and maybe you have too, the people that are the most aggressive and the most legalistic in the church are the biggest hypocrites you'll ever meet. David was not, a, was not a perfect man, but David was no hypocrite. David would write songs and give them to the priest about his own failures and sins. Did you ever consider that? Psalm 51, David confessing his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, and he writes it and gives it to the priest and says, now let's sing this in the church. Or the temple, I guess it would have been, right? Tabernacle at that time. He wasn't a hypocrite. And so there was liberty in his religion and his leadership also. But Saul had no love for the Lord. So all that was left to him was rules, law, and which he enforced with a, with a terrible cruelty. And it can fool some people because, as Paul said, 
It has an appearance of godliness because it's full of no, 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 no. But it's of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Such people should not be followed. Third and finally, look at Saul's pride here. The opposite of David. David was willing to act like a madman in order to, in order to stay alive so that he didn't have to go back and, and, and perhaps have to face down his own king. But Saul embarks on this awful campaign to kill David for his own ego's sake. David hadn't done anything. He just didn't like that people liked David more than him. He was paranoid. He was full of pride. Everything was about him. Even this conversation with the soldiers wasn't about loyalty to the Lord or to the nation, but it was loyalty to me, to me. Even above my own children, you should be loyal to me. He's taking offense. He's redirecting national resources for a personal vendetta. Pride, arrogance, pompousness, whatever you want to call that. It's bad form for a leader. And nobody wants to follow somebody like that. We read about a guy like that in 3 John. Now listen, friends. If John the Apostle wrote a letter to our church, would you want to hear what was in it? Like if John the Apostle wrote a letter to Calvary Chapel Trustville addressing all of our specific issues and encouraging us with the prophetic apostolic authority, would you want to hear that letter? Somebody, somebody's a Christian here. That's good. <laughs> I would. I mean, come on. How would you feel if you found out that John had sent that letter, that I went into my office one morning and there was a gold letter from Jesus to our church sitting on that desk, and I threw it away? Because a lot of stuff was in there about how I wasn't being a good pastor. How would you feel about me? You know, yeah, I don't want to say it out loud. <laughs> well, this was going on in the book of 3 John. 3 John 9 and 10, he said, I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first. There's a description. <laughs> Stephen, full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Diotrephes, likes to put himself first does not acknowledge our authority. So John says, if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Diotrephes was building his own little kingdom where I'm the leader, I'm the apostle, I don't acknowledge John or Peter or Bartholomew or any of those guys, and any missionaries coming from Antioch or anywhere else are not welcome in this church. And if you think otherwise, there's the door say that there were no more leaders like that today. But they're out there. Pharaoh was a terrible leader because he was full of pride. He was hard-hearted. He watched his entire nation get destroyed systematically by the power of God. And he says, I don't care. I'm Pharaoh. I'm a God myself. Not even God can tell me what to do. Until eventually the, even his own priests, false priests, were begging him to let the people go. Ahab, the king of Israel, had a little season of his life where he tried to become all spiritual and religious and had 400 different prophets of the Lord in his court. Isn't that cool? 400 prophets? But guess what? If they didn't prophesy good things, he put him in prison. There was one good prophet named Micaiah. And uh, King Jehoshaphat from Judah, who was a godly man, says, is there another prophet of the Lord? Because he sees these 400 guys and one of them had like horns that he put on his head and was saying, God is going to lead us forward like a bull. And He's like, you got anybody else? Well, yeah, there's this guy, Micaiah, but I hate him because he never says anything good. That's a bad leader, right? Anytime I get bad news, off to the dungeon with you. Even if it's bad news from God. Remember King Herod? Herod Agrippa in the book of Acts? He stands up and he speaks. And the people say, this is the voice of a God and not a man. And when the Lord struck him, do you remember what he struck him with? Nobody remembers? Worms. He was eaten by worms. And I don't know if it happened just then or if God created one little worm in his belly right then. And that led to him developing the condition. Anyway, so that's a God and not a man. And God goes, oh, really? Let's see you, oh, divine one, get out of this. Pride. It's not becoming of a leader. Leadership is servanthood. We must be servants. I saw somebody online recently and it drove me crazy, but they had this whole thing on like leadership. And this is an age where we got to stop thinking of leadership as servanthood. That, that's weak thinking. That's not manly thinking. That's weak. And it's, yeah, it is not, it is weak thinking. And it might not be the kind of thinking that men have, but it is divine thinking. It's God's thinking. And it's what Jesus said. 
But it's also just practical too. If your leadership sees other people that are beneath you as an opportunity to pump you up, it becomes an opportunity for advancement and aggrandizement. You're not leading anybody. You've just got a bunch of lackeys that are there to build you up. That's a bad leader. People become tools to serve you. They're treated as nothing. You ever feel that way when somebody was leading you? Like, they really don't care about me at all. They just use me. You ever had a boss like that that just ran through people and just like, we're going to work you until you can't take it anymore, and then we'll fire you, we'll bring somebody else, we'll start the process all over again. That's not a servant leader. That's somebody who sees you here as to feed my process. And I know as people, we're attracted to people with swagger. We're attracted to people who have that pomp about them, people that are followed and admired. But wise men and women ought to reject that kind of leadership. A leadership is to be humble, to be a servant, not full of pride. Saul was, and it led to the death of the priests of the Lord. We finish this chapter now with a positive note. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, circle that name, we'll see him a lot in the future, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. That's, that's taking responsibility. The opposite of Saul, right? Stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. And with me you shall be in safekeeping. Only one priest, Abiathar, escaped. And he will become the priest that will serve David during his lifetime. He came to David. And David's heartbroken over this. So he takes Abiathar under his wing and protects him. And he also doesn't try to shift blame here. Even though it wasn't David's fault. It was Saul's fault. It was Doeg's fault. But David goes, if I hadn't, hadn't done this, this never would have happened. I can't believe, I'm so sorry. You come with me and I'll make sure that you're always safe. Can you see how David attracts followers? Meanwhile, Saul is getting abandoned by even his personal guard. His son doesn't want to follow him anymore. His bodyguard won't do what he tells him to do. And now the priests are running away from him out into the wilderness to follow David. Men like Saul demand obedience. But their fear leads to poor decisions. Their lack of real piety results in cruelty and their pride alienates people. And leaders like this, friends, will abandon you eventually. Not only that, if you become that kind of leader, the people you are leading will also abandon your leadership. I'll go further. I say we ought to abandon leaders of this kind. Certainly in the church, or at least be praying for them. It's like if, you're, if this is how you lead, I'm not confident in where you're leading me. Any amends on that one? But for each of us, lead like this. And you'll find, as that old proverb says, he who leads but nobody follows is simply going for a walk. There are cases when you have the opportunity to change leadership. Maybe you should. There are other times when you've got to stick it out and pray for the Lord to help you help that person. But it all comes down to this. Matthew 20. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. If you're the leader, you're the chief servant. Jesus, of course, is our ultimate example of leadership. Someone who we delight to follow. And Jesus was the ultimate servant, wasn't he? Let's be like him. Those who are filled with faith and loving servant leadership will never lack for support. While the fearful, prideful tyrants are going to spend their whole lives looking over their shoulders and seeing if somebody's coming for them. Whatever leadership situation you're in, look to yourself. Look to yourself. Let God work out the obedience of those that are supposed to be following you while you serve him first. And as we look around the world in any domain of life as who we should follow, we should be examining them not by our own opinions, but by the holy standard that God has given us. 